Hello, BookTube. As you can see, I have yet another guest. This is Alex from the BookTube channel, Kingly Endeavors. Uh, care to wave to the people? Hello. <laughs> Alex has recently, he was on BookTube years ago, and he has recently revived his channel, which is dedicated to analyzing and talking about the novels of Stephen King and the order in which they were published. Yeah. Is that right? Is that a fair summary? Yeah, that is right. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And the number one question uh, that I have that I think most people watching will have is why would you choose to do this when you know that it will displease me? <laughs> that actually has become... That's a paraphrase of General Zod's comment in Superman 2 where he says, why do you say this when you know that I will kill you for it? <laughs> <laughs> what, does he say who who is this god character oh no zod or, what, yes, the yes. The, the president of the united states kneels e.g marshall kneels and says oh god and zod rolls his eyes and says, not god zod <laughs> like <laughs> like the, you can't teach these humans anything <laughs> but anyway well, you getting back to the subject why did you decide to do this when you know it displeases me why I'm you sure that everyone become, will want to know. <laughs> well, you have become a voice in my ear and you keep coming up now in the videos um, where I anticipate like, okay, let me pause. Yes, you did a wonderful and graphic. This and roll his eyes. You did a wonderful, yes. he was right graphic. Yes, uh, with Erasmus, or as you always say, the Dutch humanist Erasmus, Erasmus, excuse me. Um, yeah, I did this because I was interested in Stephen King and he was such an influential voice when I was growing up. And then I wanted to go back and look at it because so few... First of all, I don't know if you would agree. I don't think the Stephen King phenomenon will ever happen again of a pop novelist doing MasterCard commercials and just becoming that kind of rock star. Like even if we ever have another novelist who does horror stories or thrillers and he gets a film adaptation every year and then a TV movie adaptation every year, I don't think the Stephen King thing will ever happen again. Do you think he so kind of belongs to his decade? Future generations will never experience an author who's quite so unambiguously a whore. <laughs> and yet you sound sad about this no i'm not like sad it. about it no i no. i just think it's interesting that he is very much strikes me as being a product of his time um and increasingly at first i just wanted to explore his body of work and see because i had heard about sort of the connected stephen king universe different characters pop up in different books i wanted to see how that played out but then what ended up sort of dominating my interest was the development of king's sensibility and how i know you're gonna balk at this how his talent goes up and then cocaine comes in and it goes down a little bit but then i think some his my two favorite of the first 25 or so that i've read are cujo and misery which i think were under the influence of heavy drugs and yet they're like the only ones that come in under like 350 pages from that from that period um and it's just interesting to see, because I've read his memoir a bunch of times. That was one of my favorite books growing up. And he's a very open guy and very sincere. An analogy I've been drawing, I don't know if this makes any sense to you, is between Stephen King and Joe Biden. I guess just because the two of them have been on my mind a lot. And you get a sense that both of them, though not always great at their job, you have a sense that they're genuinely interested in the job itself, that they would be doing it for free and would have done it for free their whole lives. Um, Where? That sincere anywhere in the five million words that Stephen King has written, do you detect even the smallest glimmer of him being interested in the craft of writing novels? Where? Anywhere oh, well. in all of that, including the multiple times he has novelists as characters. Where do you detect that? Where? Oh, I see it all over the place, particularly in the 90s, um, where I think he's, he gets, he gets sober in like 89, 90, and then his books become way more chatty and it's way more like him patting the sofa cushion beside himself and asking you to, to join him. Whereas in the eighties, it's just event, 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 joke, joke, joke. It's, I don't know. I, I do think he's interested in craft. And then when you read memoir on the, his memoir on writing, like, I don't know, he has some interesting thoughts about how writing is a, is a kind of telepathy and, he, he seems like a very critical, constructive reader. And he gives you those examples of how Tom Wolfe would construct a scene versus how Cormac McCarthy would do it. And neither of those styles are his styles, but here are the strengths. I don't know. I, I think he is genuinely interested in it. Maybe a better reader than writer. Um, he's certainly a very generous guy. You can see, you and I were talking about this in our last conversation about whether or not authors 
are actually saying the things that they blurb on the backs of books. But Stephen King has been incredibly generous with young novelists, with debut novelists, particularly in the field of horror and thriller and putting his name out there. And you do get a sense that he's, he feels like a, not in a pretentious way, but like a keeper of the gate. And he tries to be constructive. You know, are you familiar with his dollar babies deal? Well, ophthalmologically, I can't squint any harder <laughs> than I'm doing and it's having no effect whatsoever. That's why I'm staring at the lens. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't have to deal with this. My, op my optometrists would certainly caution against squinting any harder than I'm already doing. And it's not working. I think, so I, you know, I know you are such an advocate of like- the question of why you're doing this when you know I don't want you to. You're going to dodge that in a typical elected politician way. You're going to pretend you didn't hear I, it. Is this mic live? You're going to leave the room with your entourage. You're going to dodge that question. Okay, fine. So we'll move on to another question since you've dodged the first question. Well, it's not, it's not dodging. I mean, you, you've had a very pernicious influence in my life to a degree because I always think I'm not doing anything bad. It's kind of like smoking. I think I'm not doing anything bad when I would drive an hour to work and an hour back listening to Steve Donahue. Like, oh, it's just Steve. It's just in the background, not even paying that much attention. And then suddenly I'm reading a book and I'm like, am I allowed to like this? Where? <laughs> That's exactly the right response. <laughs> if only everyone in the world had that response, what would Steve do? Is that so much to ask? But anyway, we'll move on to my next question. And I'm sure that a lot of people in the audience are going to hope you don't dodge this one. And that is, do you think there's any validity to the observation that the reason why so many young men of a certain age on YouTube are currently or have worshipfully page by page done a recension of Stephen King's collected works. Here are the top 10. Here's the next top 10. Here's the bottom top 10. I'm going to go through each novel, novel by novel. I'm going to go through each novel in, in the context of when I first read it. We're going to go over the novels in connection with the movies. Do you think there's any truth to this, the hypothesis that these young men are doing that because they have a handle on Stephen King because they know him. It's familiar territory. These young men will never do that with Anthony Trollope or John Cheever. They'll never do that with those kinds of authors. But with Stephen King, despite how much he's written, you feel like you know it. You know the parameters. Is it possible? Do you think, in other words, to put it, to put it in a nutshell, since I have been accused of going on at great length, do you think there's any truth to the incel hypothesis of why Stephen King is so popular? No, not that particular hypothesis. But okay, I'm going to ask you a question that you're not going to like. Um, but it's going. But I have a reason. I'll for ask the questions this around story. here, Bub. <laughs> well, wait. Have you read Cl Clifton Halen's new Bob Dylan biography? Because I know Bob Dylan is not your guy. No, he's not my guy. And ordinarily, I would I would squint even harder to have you read question. But this is a forthcoming book and I haven't read it yet. No. Why? Um, OK, so I read it and there was some interesting commentary about it in that in order to write this allegedly the first of a two volume biography, you can tell the writer is obsessed with Bob Dylan. But as you read the book, it's really you really wondered. It seems like he hates Bob Dylan but he's obsessed and it's almost like pale fire where the book is interesting, mostly interesting because you can see the biographer passive aggressively confronting this character that he's obsessed with. And in, when you read people talk like the Bob Dylan experts writing about Bob Dylan, or I was just reading Louis Menon's book when he has got that chapter on rock and roll and you see how people were so immerse themselves in the discography of, of the Beatles or some major influential, it's kind of like, you can't ask the question to them, which is your favorite Bob Dylan album? Which is your favorite Beatles album? Because they're like, well, it depends. Do you mean sober Bob Dylan? Do you mean post motorcycle accident Bob Dylan? Do you mean Christian Bob Dylan? And it's kind of like when people do those hierarchies of here are the best Stephen King novels, I, I don't know what that would mean. You'd have to establish what your criteria is. Scares, because I don't think he's ever written anything scary. Um, I think he, he writes things that lend well to a cinematic interpretation. Um, and he steers clear of them for the most part, because I think he understands that. I think lately he's just been like, for the past 30 years, his books have seemed to me emotionally flayed. Like he was very humble. I think he had a major mortality scare with that car accident. 
Um, he had the extreme yes, humbling the car of intervention. Accident. Yes, indeed. Um, when and... he came out of the car accident and told the whole world he would never write another novel. And then he dashed. I don't think it was. I don't yeah. think it was right after that. I think it was a couple of years later when he finished the Dark Tower series. And then he went on Today Show and he was like, I'm done. I hate this. And then he, he's written. But didn't he, didn't, when he was, when he was under traction and in the hospital, didn't he say, no, that's, that's it. I'm done. He might have, but I think he was on drugs again, which he talks about in the memoir. Um, but then as he was re recuperating, he wrote Dreamcatcher um, in bed with a ledger in on a, I, I don't know if you've ever seen it, that Today Show interview where, He's being interviewed about writing it and writing Dreamcatcher as he was recovering. And he was like, yeah, and I wrote this one by hand. And the reporter is like, no, you didn't. Like with a disbelief bordering on contempt, um, like if he went back to the 30s and showed someone a laptop um, and he, he makes Stephen King present the ledger and he looks at it like it's some crazy artifact. It's a huge thing full of handwriting. But yeah, that, you ask why it's so hypnotic to so many people. I think but you're not saying, I mean, your, def, your Bob Dylan definition, you're not saying that you hate Stephen King. Like, yeah, couldn't yeah. be that lucky. <laughs> you're not <laughs> saying, well, you're saying something else. That, that No, that it fosters a really complicated relationship as you move through the, the line of work, because it seems like this is a guy who loves his job, loves, loves sitting down and writing so much that he doesn't wait to have a new idea. He doesn't wait to have something to say. <laughs> you got that right, Bob. <laughs> he hasn't waited in 40 <laughs> years to have a new idea. <laughs> I don't want but this to be antagonistic. It, <laughs> I'm just saying it's a, you, you, it, it fosters a very complicated relationship between the long time linear follower of Stephen King's work versus what the guy is producing. Okay. Do you think it's possible that you are wasting a bazooka level of critical attention on an author who doesn't merit it? Or are you going to say all authors merit it to the people who love them? No. And I get really like paralyzed with this question sometimes when I'm like, oh, I'm going to spend the afternoon reading this. And then I think, oh, because I'm thinking like, oh, I'm, I'm going to enjoy this book. So I'll spend my afternoon reading it. And then I immediately have this critical voice in my head that's like, shouldn't you be reading something more constructive? And then I say, well, what's more constructive? Well, read a book that's going to educate you on some, some nuance of World War II. So I start reading that. And like, for instance, I got, I was reading Max, is it Max Hastings Inferno? And it's so great. But be, in his effort to, to, to whittle the war down to 700 pages, every single sentence is dense with facts. Very readable, very friendly, very propulsive, but it's data, data, historical figure, data. And, and then that becomes unfun because I'm, I'm telling myself that it's homework. And then, I, so yeah, I get so you like I ask myself- Because he's so vapid. Exactly, exactly. Um, Why does that not feel no, like I, don't, I, I hoped for? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think that it's okay. So I was noticing in reading *Wizard in Glass*, the last, the most recent one that I did a video on. I had read half of it, like three years ago, and I had my annotations in there. And so I was reading through it, and I'm seeing the annotations from three years ago. And I've had this experience in the past where I open a book that I loved in college or in high school, and I look at the marginalia, and I see I was. Set, I kept thinking like, oh my God, I was such a better reader because I had a much sharper eye for symbolism and metaphor and, oh, this is an allusion to something that this character said 40 pages ago, stuff that goes way over my head today. And I realized that my marginalia today in the books that I'm reading over the past year or so, I'm creating like a network, like in the margin of a book, I'll say, oh, this reminds me of what so-and-so said in that other book. And I'm now my marginalia reflects a readerly impulse to try to make my books talk to one another if that makes sense. It does, but it's not less. And exactly, exactly. It's just different. And it's interesting to see I am changing as a reader, as Stephen King is changing as a writer. And I don't know, it's, it's, very, much, it's very much a platform for self-inquiry as much as it is a Stephen King thing. And also because Stephen King is so ubiquitous, everyone has read him, so many people beyond liking his books, he's just, they've grown up with him. He's a, he's a, he's a relative. Um, and so if you talk seriously and you engage with people on the basis of a shared interest in Stephen King, they might be willing to go along with you when you read some other weird, eclectic book. But um, you're five years away from even trying that experiment. No, I'm doing it now, increasingly, talking more about other things that I'm reading. Um, like, for not, instance, I have a video. You're not implying that Stephen King is getting better as a writer, are you? Or are you? I don't or know. Not, it's too complicated. Chronologically. 
it's too complicated and going up to the 90s i see it's just a different guy and it depends on what you want if you want sort of cocaine fueled you know adrenaline then cujo and his works of the 80s are what you should go to if you're looking for something conversational and warm and introspective then it's his stuff from the 90s that but, you should go to but uh, he's been writing fiction for 45 years don't you give him the ultimate get out of jail free card if you say oh it's just a different guy every five years <laughs> what about what about the idea that he would be learning that whole time that he'd be honing his craft that goes out the window if you give him the excuse of well it depends he had to rebuild from scratch in these five different periods then you're not I, holding you know, I was, the standards that you hold any other author to i don't know i was thinking about this actually something similar in reading peril bob woodward's uh, latest book and i forget who the it comes up a couple of times. He's referring to officials in the White House who have several hundred, have several hundred pages of reading to do every night pertaining to their jobs. And I think like, oh, I bet so many of these people jumped into this profession because they love history and they love, you know, reading about politics. And yet I bet they never get to read. And it makes sense. Um, and I think Stephen King has gotten to, I think of Ray Bradbury in this, in this respect, he was always like, don't think, just write emotionally, 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 don't. But don't it is to possible look, to evaluate to... Bradbury's arc as a creator. It's not only possible to do that, it's ethically incumbent on you to do that. It's incumbent on somebody to say, okay, Brad, Bradbury writing his second to last novel in his life. Did he learn anything? Is he a better writer than he was when he started? Is he more worthwhile after all that time. Nobody King is Bradbury. Rich. Well, no, you, it's I, a totally different Bradbury. You know, you're starting all over again after the first divorce or the second divorce or World War II. No, not, not starting all over that. again. But I do think there, I do think there comes a point where he, because he's a professional writer and he's got the means to just write comfortably and release as he pleases. And he thinks of it less as like a contribution to the culture as just something that he likes to do. I think there comes a point where he says, okay, I've cultivated my voice cultivated my craft and now I'm just going to exercise it and see where it takes me emotionally as opposed to just constantly playing with form and voice and experimenting with new things he's not trying to be John Barth and he's not you know trying to he's not he's not contemplative about the form of the novel I think he's just trying to tell good stories this is how I feel just that's how I feel you are in my life just yawning in my ear that's all the, the only thing that anybody <laughs> cares about is Frida Yoga she does it in everything that's the only thing they care about is <laughs> <laughs> she does that exact same maneuver in every video <laughs> and now she's gonna hesitate about jumping back up yeah she hates jumping back up hates it but, did she get uh, injured when she when she hit the side no no it's just the, the throw rug the throw rug uh, right at the foot of the, of the couch went out from underneath her and she bumped against the couch instead of jumping up onto it but the, with a little dog who expects the whole world to obey her that was major. <laughs> Did you hear that that's how Jimmy Fallon lost a finger? Um, his, his said his wife had bought some new rug and it was all not, it had like artful knotted knots around it and he tripped and hit the finger with his wedding ring. Maybe this is a metaphor. It snagged the edge of a coffee table and just sheared. He said it was just bone um, and they reattached the finger. There are a few I think weeks where he's on the show with his whole hand wrapped in gauze. Similar to well, what you're Holder saying is you'd like set. to talk about anything other than the wretched car crash that is Stephen King's writing career. I mean, I would love to talk about it so long as you're not doing yoga on my ear. And <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> breathing I, hot dog I don't have any just... control over it. I don't know why she does it. And I don't know why she does it. No, I'm saying to you. Do. That's you. That's, oh. that's, I have this weird Steve conscious about how I'm using my readerly time. And it's always nattering uh so so what is the plan for kingly endeavors since i'm really sure that in more. watching this video you have gained converts to your unholy cause <laughs> losing, what what is the plan for those of you for, for viewers who might not have been watching you all those years ago when it was a fresh face alex who was starting his channel when his yeah, whole life was in front of him and he had infinite possibilities it wasn't the battered old aragorn-esque wreck that we have in front of us <laughs> where you don't even have the strength of will to yell out ellen do and you don't know what i'm talking catch about that reference yeah because you haven't read anything but this one <laughs> <copy off. laughs> i'm sorry i didn't mean i don't mean this to be adversarial <laughs> no 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 not your intention at all 
Um, what, what is the plan for kingly endeavors? I don't know. Finish, read them all, read all the novels. And I mean, he's still doing like two a year. He's still um, doing two a year. Yeah. Incidentally, you you mentioned your skepticism about the authorship. You're willing to grant the benefit of the doubt to the authorship claims of the new John Le Carré book, saying that marginal author stock. Yes, I am marginally willing. Books. Every oh, every once does. in a while, a picky author. John Le Carré was a picky author. Every once in a while, they will have a book that doesn't work. They just can't get it to work. And if they have sufficient eminence with their publisher, they can just tell the publisher, this isn't working, I'll write something else without having the whip cracked. In which case that book just becomes a well-worn talisman. They just keep going back to it. That is the characterization that his son makes about this book. Okay, that's fine. No author ever has more than one of those books. So if you're gonna, you can't try that a second time. And I have my doubts. John Le Carré was very much the kind of writer that Patrick O'Brien was. The, the kind of writer that doesn't work it out on the page. Instead, they work it out in the cement mixer and what comes out on the page is the finished thing. Mm. Some authors are like that. Shelby Foote was like that. Patrick O'Brien was like that. John Le Carré was like that. Authors who are like that tend not to have that novel that they just can't make work. They tend not, That tends not to exist. But I'm going to take his son at his word. But why, why do you ask? Because you know, I, I know that... Off? Stephen King. Well, no, Stephen. Stephen Authorship King, questions I, I, when it comes to Stephen King. No, no. Who would admit Stephen, writing stuff that bad? Nobody would. <sighs> I have a character at the beginning of the novel who's losing weight. He can't figure out why. <laughs> will he figure out why, or will he lose so much weight he drifts off into space? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, him losing so much weight that he drifts off into space is a really obvious, hackneyed thing to do. So I won't do. No, wait. <laughs> Who am I kidding? I'm Stephen King. Of course I'll do it. Instead. <laughs> signal that I know what a crappy idea it is. I'll have some character in the novel say, you know what would be a really crappy idea here? Would be if you kept losing weight until you float out there. There you go. If I've made meta commentary, it doesn't matter if it's good or not. It shows I'm aware that it's bad. Oh my God, look at the time. <laughs> so, you, so you don't like Stephen King? How did we get on that? They're saying that Stephen King and Walter Mosley, I know oh, it's right. you guys who say that they but for the protest of their agent and editor, they would publish more than two books a year. And so I think I'm very far from wrapping up Kingly Endeavors because I think even we'll have a few posthumous Stephen King books. I'm just thinking a James few. Patterson, that'll happen for a <laughs> hundred years. We'll have a million Stephen King books. He'll never stop publishing books. Even if they're not posthumous, his publisher will say Stephen King's carry the fourth sequel. Stephen King's yeah. Cujo, the miniature schnauzer. Oh yeah. yeah. That's true. Unless Stephen King buys his, his own literary rights, which I don't think does enough money in creation to do that. Or maybe stipulates legally somehow, no, you cannot do this. If you do this, my legal executor can sue you. I, I think, think his so. son will carry the mantle not to play with the King name, and, but he will be heir to, the, to, the, to that throne. What do you I wouldn't think be surprised if he ends work? up inheriting. Have you read I've only read I've only read Heart Shaped Box. Um, and I think I was turned off from chancing the fireman because didn't you say it was way too long? Well, yes. Stephen King and any of his genetic progeny, I think it's way too long the minute you get past the typing of the name. Uh, fireman was, was dumb and predictable and <laughs> a number of other things, I believe a certain critic called it a hack off the old block. Uh, <laughs> But that's that's it. You've never been curious to try the son's later works. I have, but he just really after Heart Shaped Box, it was just tome after tome, and I don't. I think there really needs to be a get to know you phase. Well, I know you're gonna, you would roll your eyes at this, but I think James Joyce's body of work is a good model for this. Where when he's getting to know you, it's Dubliners. Everyone can read Dubliners. If you like that, he's got something a little bit weirder. Maybe you'll like it. It's very slim. Portrait of the Artist, if you really like that, if you really like that, there's Ulysses. And if you really liked Ulysses, there's Finnegan's Wake. There's a feeling of he's 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 waiting, like he's waiting to build up an account to the Bank of Steve. Joyce never succeeds, but you get a sense where he's like, I'm gonna introduce myself to the reader and make them trust me first. I, I really don't, I think I, I have trouble with the implicit arrogance of publishing a 500 page debut which is not what he did, but he followed a 250 page debut with a brick. 
50. There were 50 Irish authors writing fiction at the time of Joyce, 50. All 50 are better than he is. Don't know their names at all. Liam O'Flaherty, maybe. Otherwise, otherwise, nobody. Otherwise, no one knows their name, male or female. 50. <laughs> so the plan with Kingly Endeavors is to make videos for the rest of Stephen King's oeuvre. Yes. Or do you have a, a prescribed cutoff point? No, I, he keeps turning them out and um, I keep seeing them show up on the remainder shelf. So yeah, just keep going. <laughs> and, and then pepper, pepper the channel with videos about other things. Um, about so. me? Yeah, mostly, entirely about you. Um, you infiltrate every critical thing I try to say about a book. Um, but and it's I not don't even like the novels of Stephen King. I too have read them all, and I don't like them. They're self evidently bad. So we are clashing. <sighs> we are clashing. Why is that? You You're must saying be doing something wrong. <laughs> you say some of them are self evidently bad. Yeah. There are some, it's not like you're, you're not like a Stephen King acolyte who's going to say that he didn't do anything wrong. He wrote bad. No, books. no. Oh my God, horrible. And you'd also be willing to say that he also sober wrote bad books, that without drugs being involved or the withdrawal from drugs, he is capable of writing a bad book. Yeah. Although, Quite a because you're not, I think are they're you? interesting. You're not willing to do that. I mean, sober, I just, he, is, he is perfect, like your precious Cormac. No. Macau. No. What's a sober I, you know, book he I, wrote that is flawed fundamentally? I don't mean that the Stephen King guest appearance goes wrong. I mean that the thing is flawed fundamentally. As I was saying in the Wizard and Glass thing, it's at least at least 100 pages too long. And on every every single page, there's either three or four sentences that don't need to be there or an image that is presented twice. Um, it's a good Western, but it could have been... I, it's. Louis L'Amour would have given it the proper treatment of 200 pages. And yet, oh my God, I don't think I mentioned this to you when we were speaking last time, but this was Wizarding Glass, which is a thousand pages, is the first Stephen King book I read on Kindle. And you know how in Kindle, there's a dotted line. You might've deactivated this. There's a dotted line that will show you what other people have highlighted, like the most popular highlighted passages. Yeah. And yeah, you know, when you're, reading, when you're reading any other book, as you get further in the book, there are fewer and fewer highlights because pe most people don't read to the end of the book. But in reading the drawing, in reading Wizard and Glass, there would be a passage with, you know, 1,100 highlights on page 700. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> and so it seems that people, oh, that's I think, incredible. <laughs> like to luxuriate in the voice, which I think if you binge it, can like any, any other voice can become kind of frustrating. Like Deb said to you in your Manatee Monday recently, about the Dresden Files, that she really is enjoying it and she likes to power through, but she she does like a four book binge and then just can't stand the voice for a little while. Okay, but okay, but objectively speaking, just objectively speaking, Wizard of Glass is not a good Western. And when you so, say that it is, I automatically want to know what Westerns you've read. And I'd be willing to bet yeah, it's I four. Know. I'd be willing to bet it's four total maximum. If that. I mean, well, then, but mostly I'm thinking of, I don't think it's Western novels that are influencing his sensibility there. I think it's Western movies. And what kept coming to mind was Destry Rides Again. There's a very big Destry vibe there. Um, and then I've, I've seen a lot of Westerns, although I know you think I've seen no Westerns at all because I haven't seen The Shootist. <laughs> Someday you will. Someday. I will. It is, it's available on Amazon Prime, I think, for free if you're... No. The shoot is... I so. oh, I'd watch it again tonight. Really? Awesome. It's incredible. It's John Wayne and Lauren Bacall. It's... Lauren Bacall? If we're talking about the shootist... I thought she was retired by then. I thought she retired in was. the 70s. You oh, don't turn right. down the Duke. <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, <laughs> you don't stay in retirement if John Wayne asks you to, to star with him in a movie especially his last movie. And it's incredible. Just amazing. Such an intelligent adult movie. No pandering at all. Just wonderful. I was warned in the Reagan biography to read that John Wayne sent Reagan a letter. When Reagan was saying we shouldn't give the Panama 
canal back to Panama. And uh, John Wayne sent him a letter like, you don't know what you're talking about, like very brusque and abrasive, I think, because his wife was from Panama. Or Could, one be. Of uh, Could be. Could be. Where, where, where once again, you've chosen to talk about anything other than the wretched career that is Stephen King. I mean, I follow the winds of conversation as you do. So are, is he the type of author to finish up here? Is he the type of author who you're eager for their next book? I mean, I, I have like 30 to go before I catch up to in the moment Stephen King. And I've never really understood the sensibility where people say like, oh, it, it would have been so great to have been, to be able to await, to be a diehard Beatles fan in the 60s and 70s and to be able to await the next album. I think that's torturous. I like to approach a completed body of work and then sort of assess it. But Except um, for Cormac. No, I don't. I don't know what your deal is about Cormac McCarthy. I think he's a good writer. You have the expected release date of his next book tattooed on your left nipple. So that no, is because not my left nipple isn't big enough because there's been that too is many releases. knowing dates. what it feels like to anticipate something. No, no. He, and his book is done. I think he's holding out. But I think we discussed this, that he's trying to create a, an income for his kid down the line. So, so you're saying that because of kingly endeavors, you won't read a new Stephen King book? Yeah, I don't want to jump ahead. I want to be able to see how things change, how things develop. Interesting. You don't want that to spoil it. You don't want that to ruin yeah. the point in your head. Yeah. It'll be so, weird. Also, the recurrence of characters. Um, I'm saying I'm re right now I'm reading Bag of Bones. And in the first hundred pages of Bag of Bones, there's, I mean, I'm not, there's like six Stephen King characters from other books popping in and out. Um, and you've learned that they're dead. It's, it's weird. I think, I don't know. Bag of Bones is a weird one, which I look forward to discussing. It sounds egomaniacal and self-referential, <laughs> which wouldn't make it weird for Stephen King at all. <laughs> okay. And on that note... <laughs> Glad I caught you on your good day. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I should get out my Southern gentleman glove. You have offended me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, before we started this, you said uh, Free was going to have to go to the bathroom at 2.30. On the dot at 2.30, oh, she goodness stood gracious. up and yawned. Oh, goodness. Well, I was, I was trying to save a soul, is what I was trying <laughs> to do. Okay? <laughs> it didn't work. But uh, I'm going to leave a link. All of you are watching. I'm going to leave a link to Kingly Endeavors down below. If Stephen King is your favorite author and you haven't been dissuaded, you're never going to hear him talked about any better. Anyway. <laughs> than by my guest so go on over and welcome alex back to the ranks of book two <laughs> thank you for your cordial dishonesty i know it's been so kind hasn't it <laughs> any of you other book two is why come on <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're raking them in yeah they're, they're not it's not gonna happen no. <laughs> but anyway i'm gonna wrap this up and take the bean outside uh, but i will see you soon all right. Thanks for having me, Steve. I appreciate it. See ya. <laughs>